Hey everyone, my name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Refreshing Global Energy Security Policy and Infrastructure for the Energy Transition. We are grateful to our moderator, Dr. Steve Griffiths, and our distinguished panelists for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services you can find on our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have any questions for our panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Steve Griffiths, Senior Vice President for Research and Development and Professor of Practice at Khalifa University. Steve, over to you. Thanks very much, Dave, and thanks to everyone attending today's webinar focused on refreshing global energy security and infrastructure for the energy transition. As Dave mentioned, I'm Steve Griffiths, Senior Vice President of Research and Development at Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, and I'm moderating the panel session today. Joining me on the panel are three very distinguished energy experts that I'm sure many of you will be knowing. Uh, Mark Finley, a fellow in energy and global oil at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. We also have Ken Medlock, the Senior Director of the Center for Energy Studies at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. And he's also the James A. Baker III and Susan G. Baker Fellow in Energy and Resource Economics at Rice University. And finally, Morgan Bazilian, the director of the Payne Institute and professor of public policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Before moving into the opening remarks from each of our panelists, I'll give a little bit of background and context to the discussion of our webinar today. The discussion today is based on work that's been undertaken by myself and the three panelists on behalf of the T20 or Think20, which is one of the engagement groups under the G20, which is being chaired this year by Saudi Arabia. As many of you will be aware, the G20 or Group of 20 is a key global forum for bringing together leaders in developing and developed countries to discuss the world's most pressing financial and socioeconomic issues. The T20 is specifically responsible for connecting and collaborating with regional and international think tanks through task forces focused on topics of key importance to the G20's efforts. The T20 is organized into a set of topically focused task forces and one of these task forces for this year is focused on sustainable energy, water, and food systems. A priority of the task force, which myself and the panelists are sitting, is energy security, market stability, and economic and environmental vulnerabilities. The priority of this particular topic was highlighted, in fact, by the G20 last year at the Osaka Summit in Japan. In the Osaka, in the Osaka Summit, the leader's declaration stated, and here I'll quote, we acknowledge the importance of global energy security as one of the guiding principles for the transformation of energy systems, including resilience, safety, and development of infrastructure and undisrupted flow of energy from various sources, suppliers, and routes. This particular statement came within a broader acknowledgement, and again, I quote, the importance of energy transitions that realize the three E plus S in order to transform our energy system into affordable, reliable, sustainable, and low greenhouse gas emission systems as soon as possible. And here, when I say the three E plus S, I'm talking about energy security, energy economics, energy efficiency, and environment and safety. Taking collectively, these statements reflect the exact context of the topic of today, which is understanding energy security policy within the context of transitions to lower carbon energy systems. With this as background, today's webinar will exactly explore the status of global energy security and the challenges presented by a transition to low carbon energy systems. We're gonna discuss these these uh, transitions and then look at recommendations for achieving a refresh of energy security policy and infrastructure that support this transition. Additionally, and in line with these current issues and challenges we're facing around COVID-19, we're gonna look at the short and longer term impacts on energy security of the COVID-19 
global energy, global energy demand shock and related oil and natural gas price decline. As you already told in the beginning of the presentation discussion, please do submit your questions during the course of our panel and we'll be happy to address your questions following open remarks from some panelists. Let me now turn to our first panelist, Morgan Bazillion. Morgan's gonna talk a little bit about the status of global energy security and the challenge presented by the noted low carbon energy system transition. So Morgan, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Steve. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And nice to be with all of uh, my friends and colleagues. Um, and thanks to the IAEE to, for hosting this event. I'm, I'm only gonna make a few short comments around the, these issues. Um, the, in the United States recently, uh, um, during this um, current administration and, and then moving into the oil market crash and the COVID-19 pandemic, the term um, energy security has been bantered around quite a bit and, and mostly uh, equated with uh, what's known as energy dominance or energy um, independence. And the, the, those terms uh, are, are politically um, attractive and have been politically attractive for, for some time, not just in the United States, but in many countries. And what's become clear through the current uh, set of crisis is that um, the energy system is deeply interconnected. And that should be considered a strength rather than a weakness. And so that the independence uh, it is, is not the goal, but rather uh, a goal of a, a secure, re reliable, resilient uh, energy system. And we can see that every day now, uh, reflected not only in the, in the markets uh, and pricing, but also in the geopolitics that are emerging around these uh, related uh, crises. And so I think it's a, it's a great time for the T20 and the G20 to um, keep refining the, how they address energy security. Of course, energy security has been a part of the G20 conversations for, for uh, many years uh, under several different presidencies and has made it its way into the ministerial declarations and under the leaders' declarations uh, for energy alongside uh, climate change and low carbon needs. So the, the topic is, is terribly salient. It's become very clear that uh, we're in a deeply interconnected system and that energy security as a goal, if defined in a sophisticated way that includes uh, affordability, availability, et cetera, um, is going to um, be important going forward. And hopefully the leaders at the G20 will, will continue to um, make it a priority. Thank you. Steve, would you like me to uh, just jump right in off of that? Mark, from here, you'd like to, we'd like to hear a little bit about the uh, refresh we talked about on the global energy security policy and the infrastructure for the transition. I know you've mm -hmm. done quite a bit of work with us on this topic, so if you could please tell us what uh, your thoughts have been and how we look at this issue. Great, yep, absolutely. And uh, let me uh, add my thanks uh, you know, to Morgan's, to you know, Steve for organizing this and to uh, Dave Williams and the great team at the IAEE uh, for providing us uh, with the, uh, uh, the global platform. Um, you know, as uh, Steve mentioned, uh, this work that grew out of uh, uh, work that analysis that he and I, Ken and Morgan have been doing within the T20 uh, process. And our premise, you know, as you can tell from the title, is that the global energy security framework, both policies and hardware, uh, could use a refresh as we push for a transition to a lower carbon energy future. Moreover, uh, that the G20 under Saudi Arabia's presidency this year is the right place and the right time to do it. So first on the refresh, energy security is not a new concept. Uh, as with so many other things, Winston Churchill got there first. Over a century ago, he was worrying about it when he considered changing fuel for, for the British Navy from coal to oil. Better performance, but not domestically produced. He concluded back then that safety and security 
lie in oil, lie in variety and in variety of alone. Let me repeat that quote. Safety and security in oil lie in variety and variety alone. And there it is, the key word that has dominated and driven energy security discussions ever since, oil. The framework we've built over the past century is focused on oil, strategic stockpiles, emergency preparedness exercises, war games, if you will, most notably under the auspices of the IEA, the International Energy Agency, including policies uh, to aim at fuel switching and demand restraint. Um, there's cooperative protocols backed by treaty obligations for sharing supplies in emergencies. And by the way, it's not only about consumers. You know, consider the strategic perspective of Saudi Arabia in maintaining a buffer of spare production capacity for use during a crisis. But as we push for a shift to lower carbon energy sources, the energy security framework needs to keep up. Now, to be fair, the International Energy Agency and some of its member countries have begun to expand their work on energy security for other fuels. You can see recent work on natural gas and most recently on electricity, but those efforts are really in their infancy still. So that's the case for a refresh. Let me turn next to why we think the G20 is the right forum. Most obviously, because G20 members include the world's biggest energy consumers and the biggest energy producers. Indeed, the G20 membership accounts for about 80% of global energy consumption and energy-related CO2 emissions, and also about 75% of global energy production. Indeed, the world's single largest producer and consumer of every single form of energy is a G20 member. But more importantly, we think it's the right group to take the energy security conversation beyond the traditional adversarial producer-consumer dynamic. Think over the decades of OPEC versus the IEA and put it into the broader context of sustainable global economic growth and development that, as Steve noted, is the hallmark and mission of the G20. So what are we proposing? As a first step, we propose a cooperative program to expand data gathering and dissemination on global clean energy and value chains. Good decision-making needs good data, but rigorous, objective, timely information on global markets for new energy forms and related key mineral inputs is not yet at the standard that we enjoy for more established energy forms. Let me give you a concrete example. How risky are energy supplies around the world? That's a basic input for understanding and building a security policy. For oil, I can go to the US EIA website and download a time series of global oil supply disruptions. Um, and, and our good friend, Bob McNally, has published a time series that goes back 100 years on oil supply disruptions. So we can measure their frequency, their duration, their magnitude, and understand them in context. To my knowledge, there is no comparable data set for any other form of energy. So accordingly, we propose that the G20 launch an initiative to collect comprehensive data on the energy transition, infrastructure, production, consumption, trade, resources for both new energy sources and key mineral inputs. There are plenty of potential templates, including the extensive data sets developed by the International Energy Agency, as well as the International Energy Forum's Joint Oil Data Initiative, and more recently, the US State Department's Energy Resource Governance Initiative. An effort like this should seek to develop systems to display and organize data in a timely fashion and in consistent units across countries and energy sources, as well as identifying best practices for energy data transparency, collection, harmonization, et cetera. Next, we propose the creation of a diverse international expert advisory panel to baseline existing programs, ex examine their applicability in the energy transition, and consider potential new collaborative approaches. And I know what you're thinking, another expert advisory panel. We had the same thought, but this is a building block. We don't want to run out and build a strategic lithium stockpile, for example, if it won't be helpful or needed in a crisis. Collaboration is a key, as Morgan mentioned as is the case for oil, markets for new energy forms and mineral inputs are rapidly globalizing. Certainly, addressing climate change 
and sustainable economic development via an energy transition requires a global approach. To build on existing centers of expertise and represent the diverse interests of G20 members, our advisory panel would include a nominee from each member country with the aspiration of covering a range of academic, industry, and government perspectives, representing the views of both producers and consumers, as well as expertise in both established and new energy forms and minerals. The advisory group would be charged with developing a common basis for understanding and evaluating energy security. This would consider different metrics for security during the transition and work to understand potential similarities and differences for the different energy forms and minerals. For example, how might the security implications differ for fuels, which are directly consumed, versus mineral inputs? The group would also assess the potential vulnerabilities and risks that could emerge from greater use of new energy forms and mineral inputs as G20 members drive this energy transition. The current international energy security framework is built around individual policies at, at the national level, focused on oil, by the way, as well as collaborative multinational arrangements, including the IEA's emergency response system. The G20, we argue and recommend, should work to develop a coordinated parallel approach to expand the existing energy security framework to align with the energy transition. The G20 should encourage member countries, both individually and collectively, to build on the advisory group's work, understand the emerging energy security vulnerabilities and risks associated with the energy transition, and begin to develop new policies to mitigate and manage those risks and vulnerabilities. We feel this effort is important enough to justify a new permanent G20 work stream or a new multinational organization dedicated to energy security. This should absolutely be done in concert with existing arrangements and third parties, such as the International Energy Agency, OPEC, uh, the OECD, the International Energy Forum, and the International Renewable Energy Agency. In particular, the IEA's framework can serve as a useful template for new energy forms and key minerals, for gathering and select sharing data, aligning and reviewing national policies, coordinating collective action in the case of disruptions, potentially including under treaty obligations. In addition, the dialogue already existing between producers and consumers facilitated by the International Energy Forum, as well as the IEF's Joint Oil Data Initiative, can also serve as exemplars for future cooperation. Let me pause there and hand it over to uh, Ken. quite a bit. For those of you listening, uh, be thinking about what you'd like to ask Mark for clarification. Any questions you may have, please do submit those. Now I'm going to go to Ken, and Ken will be giving the last set of open remarks. And with Ken, I'd like to hear a little bit about your thoughts on the current environment around this entire topic of energy security and <clears throat> transition. I mean, we've, we've been talking about the long term and what, what can happen as we refresh and look at infrastructure, but we're in the midst of a pretty significant set of current challenges with COVID-19 and this uh, related demand to drop uh, for oil and gas and, and pricing environment, which is quite challenging. So Ken, can you tell us your thoughts on this and how this impacts and relates to the overall topic? Sure. Uh, thanks, Steve. And it's uh, great to be here with, with both of you, Mark and Morgan. Um, the, uh, the themes I think that, that Morgan and Mark both laid out in their remarks um, are very relevant for, for uh, establishing a context for discussion about what's going on right now, actually. Um, you know, we've seen this uh, devastating uh, collapse in economic activity and an associated reduction in, in energy demand. Uh, this is not just an oil story, it's an everything story, so I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, but perhaps, the, 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 the commodity that's been most on people's mind is oil, but it's precisely because it's the most transparently traded commodity. Um, we actually see in real time what's happening with prices. We see in real time what's happening with you know, positions in futures markets. We see in real time what's happening with demand and supply. So it's, uh, it's very much front of mind. And, and I often, when I talk about transparency and, and how important it is, um, uh, I actually tell my students, think about oil as a commodity. Um, it's basically, its price is posted on every street corner uh, in the world. Um, when you think about the price of natural gas or petroleum products, and there's no other commodity like that. 
right? And that really stems from its importance in uh, global economies uh, to date. Um, and of course, the collapse in demand, we've seen uh, uh, um, you know, very vividly what that's meant for uh, uh, crude product prices, uh, crude prices, and other associated energy, energy commodity prices. Um, the one thing I want to circle back to, though, um, in sort of establishing some context is, is pointing out a couple of things that I think both Mark and Morgan hit on very nicely. Uh, one, which Morgan raised, I think, in, in maybe the first thing he said was uh, energy security is not energy independence. Um, that is incredibly true. Uh, in fact, if you think about the way global oil markets and, and international trade more generally has evolved, um, it's really evolved on leveraging something that I think everybody that's listening to this can appreciate, uh, the principle of comparative advantage, right? Um, it seems, I, I'm talking about this more and more, um, and I thought this was a debate, you know, that was settled a while ago, but evidently not. Um, uh, countries that had, you know, fantastic endowments in oil resources, could produce them at low cost, um, enjoyed an advantage that they leveraged. Um, and they did so to the benefit, generally, of their economies, uh, resource curse issues notwithstanding, right? But you can look around the world and you can see, you know, countries everywhere have leveraged advantages that they have that can reach new levels of growth and prosperity. Uh, central to this is the concept of globalization. And I think that's something that is under attack right now. Um, you know, the, the idea that uh, we should retrench and reshore everything in the interest of security, um, I think is a little bit uh, misguided, uh, just to be blunt. Um, certainly, uh, when you start thinking about international trade and energy commodities in particular, so this is what we're addressing here goes beyond oil uh, and gas. It, it extends into critical minerals uh, and, and other things that are, that are you know, uh, incredibly important for the energy transition and new energy technologies. But um, when you think about trying to reshore all those things, you're effectively ignoring the principle of comparative advantage. And that will bring with it a series of unintended consequences. Now, admittedly, there's a balancing act that we must go through because uh, if a particular commodity is heavily concentrated in a region and that region's government wants to you know, exercise its position to extract excess rents from the market or geopolitical leverage, um, then this is exactly why the types of dialogues that Mark and Morgan have both mentioned are so critically important because you have, in those cases, an international response mechanism, and those can be incredibly powerful. So um, thinking about how we actually grapple with, um, you know, future disruptions uh, is, I think something that we'll be looking back at the current oil market debacle um, and uh, learning a lot of lessons from, just to be blunt. Um, you know, the fact that oil markets are so incredibly open and transparent has allowed uh, producers to respond very rapidly. It's, it's you know, been, uh, uh, the, the oil market imbalance has been transmitted through price, which is discoverable instantaneously almost. It allows producers to adjust their production decisions. It allows markets to rebalance. You don't have, um, you know, uh, uh, unnecessary uh, uh, disruptions in supply chains because everybody sees exactly what's happening in real time. Um, that leads to depth, which uh, is circular in a lot of ways because as you have market depth, you actually get more transparency, you get more discoverability, all these things sort of go hand in hand. And that's really at the core of a lot of what we're talking about and trying to create international institutions or international uh, arrangements that allow for um, uh, transparency in markets. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really one of the things that um, the establishment of the IEA and other international organizations focused on oil ultimately uh, helped to facilitate uh, was greater transparency in that space. So um, why markets? Well, because quite frankly, uh, supply and demand uh, will send signals about what to do, how to leverage certain comparative advantages again um, in a way that actually yields the most economically efficient outcome. And I think that's ultimately you know, at the core of all of this discussion. And so when we think about um, the future, we have to remember that globalization is not all that bad. 
right? It actually has facilitated some tremendous growth. And there's a, there's a massive amount of data on op economy openness and how that translates into economic growth. Um, the more and more we hear anti-globalization sentiments and the more and more we hear efforts to try to disconnect, the less liquid supply chains will become and the more subject they will be ultimately to higher costs and, 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 and disruptions that are one-off and, and potentially very uh, damaging. Um, that is, you know, at its core, why, quite frankly, trade in many dimensions. So we talk about trade in two ways. Usually we talk about trade uh, in a spatial sense, so, you know, with, with a neighbor. Um, but we can also talk about trade through the movement in and out of inventories. So stocks, this, this is actually one of the things that, um, you know, uh, led to the energy security paradigm in the oil market that we see today and, and the importance that, that inventories actually have in market balancing. And we've seen it in real time in the last two months in oil markets, right? Because there was real concern about uh, inventory capacity running short. Uh, some of those concerns are becoming abated. Um, and you have to ask the question, why? Well, it's largely because, and I think Mark and I have both pointed this out um, in, in multiple webinars we've done at the Baker Institute, but um, as prices reveal themselves, producers respond. Um, we actually made this point very emphatically at a, at a railroad commission hearing uh, about a month ago now uh, as well. And we're seeing it, right? Um, but you only get that kind of response if, again, you have transparency if you have inventories that are working appropriately, if you have supply chains that are working fluidly. Um, and oil, for all of the despair that we've seen uh, over the last two months, has really demonstrated the value of that kind of architecture. Um, and so I think going forward, we need to really think about those lessons and, and try to translate them into um, uh, other energy commodities that are emerging or that even already exist. Um, but uh, I think what I'll do is stop there and, and maybe open it up for questions. Um, uh, I just want to say again, thank you uh, to the IAE for hosting this, um, uh, but as well, uh, thank you to both uh, Mark and Morgan and, and you as well, Steve, for, uh, uh, for this dialogue. Thanks, Ken. It's a great, great opening comments. Uh, we actually have a number of questions. Uh, why don't I just start back with you, Ken? You just finished up and you said some interesting things that have triggered some thoughts from our audience. First off, that you mentioned comparative advantage and resource curses, and you mentioned both of those, those concepts. What's the difference to you? So, so the question out there is, so what's the difference? I mean, we have countries that seem to have a resource curse, but they have comparative advantage. So how do you view that in the energy security framework? Well, I mean, you, when you talk about energy security, you, there's, I guess there's an important point, right? There's security of supply, which is usually what consuming countries have been largely focused on. Um, that was really at the core of the I, IEA, right? Um, and the strategic stocks uh, and response mechanism that's built in there. Um, it was at the core of the strategic petroleum reserve creating. Um, but in reality, energy security is also about security of demand. So energy exporting countries want to be able to um, see a price and export into a market that is um, transmitted reliably. Now, resource curse is really getting at if you have a you know, um, comparative advantage in a particular um, uh, commodity and capital starts to flow in to develop that market, right, within your own um, uh, economy, does that then divert resources away from diversification? Um, and this is something that is certainly relevant, um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean that failure is imminent. Um, I mean, people like to point out the example of Norway a lot, although you know the case of Norway can't be translated into, say, the case of Nigeria or other countries. So I don't think that's really a relevant uh, context for this conversation. But certainly, uh, the majority of the research, um, and we actually are. are uh, finishing up a special issue for resources policy actually on this uh, very topic, but um, uh, the majority of the research actually does look at institutional failures and that really is at the core of a lot of what we're talking about because if you want to avoid those institutional fa failures, a lot of times you can learn from other countries who have been in similar types of circumstances or you can learn through um, uh, uh, international uh, cooperative type of arrangements um, that govern capital flows that uh, uh, um, and here we're talking about, you know, the, the, for example, there's research linking uh, countries that experience a resource curse to um, uh, 
um, you know, various international aid programs, et cetera. And there's a lot of things that are on the table here. But the point being, um, there are countries that have avoided the trap. Um, and when you look at those countries and how they've avoided the trap, you see that they are leveraging comparative advantage, but they're doing, throw th doing so with um, uh, solid institutional frameworks internal to those countries. And so that's where the international dialogue, I think, can help shape the future. Because make no mistake, when we talk about minerals, um, those are heavily concentrated in some uh, less developed countries. And so you run the risk of seeing those types of resource curse issues arise. And that's actually where this international dialogue can be so incredibly important. Great, thank you very much, Ken. Any other panelists like to make a comment on this? I have another question I think is fairly interesting. I get to quickly. Okay, let me, let me come with this question. I think it's a very good one. Uh, we started this work with the T20 before COVID-19 was an issue, and we were all just hearing about a little something out, out there in China, and now it's become a global phenomenon. With this said, and we've seen what's happened with COVID-19, its impact on the energy industry and the energy sector, are we ready for an energy transition? Is this the time to be pushing for transition? We've seen uh, the crisis of COVID-19. Everyone's panicked about what's happening to oil, what's happening to even natural gas as well, and the pricing. Is the world ready for an energy transition, which is you know, one of the key underlying themes of the work that we've been looking at? Maybe I'll start with Morgan, because the energy transition is one of the topics you cover quite, quite a lot, but I'll come back to each of the individual panelists and get your opinion on this, because it's quite fundamental to what we've been talking about in the course of this work. Sure, I, I think that's a great question. Um, th thanks for that, Steve. Um, and, and these days and in all the webinars all of us are doing, if we're not paying attention to the context of the, the current uh, pandemic, then we're, we're missing a big piece, obviously. A couple of things that have emerged in the pandemic um, relate to some of the things that uh, both uh, Ken and Mark have said. Um, there's a tendency to be more insular. So we're, we're literally more insular in our, in our daily lives now and emerging uh, themes like fear of strangers or even fear of friends emerge. So physical closeness, but also uh, in how we interact with others. Um, and then the, the other themes that emerge are the importance of institutions, the, uh, governance and institutions, and uh, the, the importance of the, the fact that the globe is even more interdependent than it ever has been. Uh, even if we are locked at home or staying at home. And so all of those have reasonable lessons for how we steer or manage an energy transition. And of course, there's more than one energy transition happening. So we've discussed aspects of the energy transition as it relates to oil and oil markets and trade and uh, some aspects of security. But there's 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 multiple ongoing energy transitions, not only by technology, so what's happening in the natural gas market is different, what's happening in power systems and electricity markets is different, what's happening in industrial spaces is different, but also, of course, how different countries and different regions are impacted or influenced by both the pandemic, the oil market crash, and energy transitions is, 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 is varied. And so too must their policy responses be varied. And that sort of emerging tapestry of uh, situations and responses is, 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 helps answer that question. Um, are we ready? Well, it, it, you know, as institutional capabilities emerge, some areas are more ready than others as, as they've re related to big, um, responses like how that relate to the to the pandemic but i would say that you know in in uh, emerging economies have a very different set of concerns and a very different set of immediate and short long-term concerns than oecd countries as an example and then if you define it by market segment you also have a different a, a, a different way to consider these things so there's no one clear answer to, to that question, but to say that, that that's important in itself. In other words, we have to, to recognize that there are temporal and spatial aspects to this, that policy has to address those 
and importantly, um, address issues of inequality and different different approaches by countries as they they seek their their answers to what an energy transition means means for them. So a couple of thoughts there. <clears throat> Just before I go to, I'm going to go to Mark in a second, but I want to follow up with you on one question because it came in here just as you were talking, I think it's quite relevant. So the question was, how does energy poverty factor in? And my question off of that question is we're talking about the G20 to set a framework for how we're gonna look at the future of energy security and, and refreshing policy, et cetera. But what about the African countries where so much of population and energy demand growth is gonna happen? The G20 is not well represented in the African continent. So is this gonna be a, a viable means of looking at energy a security refresh by focusing on the G20? What is your thought on that? Yeah, so uh, the G20 has, uh, over the last five or six presidencies, actually addressed uh, energy poverty and energy access. So there was a uh, program under the G20 uh, looking at the sub-Saharan African countries and then one more recently looking at uh, Asia or parts of Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia under energy access. So there they, they have tackled some of those issues, um, but whether or not the G20 is the best venue um, for that re remains to be seen, but they have addressed those issues. And I think it's a really important one. You know, if you look at um, issues ranging from supply chain issues to energy poverty, um, the global South, ha as I said, has a very different focus on these. And temporarily, what I meant by that was, around the globe, you're starting to see um, responses, economic responses to this, um, and whether those are stabilization funds, which are currently happening, or in, in, in how I think of it happening, and then followed by stimulus. Um, you don't have that same ability in, in most of the developing countries to um, insert that level of stabilization funds and then stimulate economies and they're coming from different very different places so I think it's a really important one to, to keep in mind how emerging economies will be dealing with this and likewise to our topic today of energy security or energy security and resilience maybe um, a better framing um, we do have to keep in mind that um, countries are starting from different places and, and facing very different uh, different pressures. Thanks, Morgan, appreciate that. So let me now go back to Mark. We almost had you a minute ago. So Mark, your thoughts on, is this the right time for energy transition? Mm -hmm. I, well, um, I, my personal perspective is that um, it is the right time because we have to get the world on a more sustainable path. And that's something that applies to all of us and everyone you know, around the world at, at some level. Um, you know, the actual responses that we've seen um, are, are a classic psychological ink blot test because it reveals, you know, priorities and and uh, um, you know emphasis. You know, in Europe, uh, you know, it's been a lot of talk about using the stimulus um, that's needed to you know keep the economy functioning. You know, in the face of the COVID-related shutdown, to advance the transition. Um, significantly less so here in the United States uh, and in many emerging uh, economies. Um, in fact, just here in Washington, D.C. today, the Washington Post has uh, some uh, commentary on uh, dissent within the progressive wing of the uh, Democratic Party over the House leadership's uh, lack of interest in pushing uh, for green stimulus, uh, you know, as part of the next round of bailouts. And so, you know, we see priorities revealed in the way these responses have been playing out around the world. Um, I think a more um, an, an equally fundamental question is, how does the COVID-19 experience change people's perspectives on the energy system? Um, and there, I think if, if the answer, unfortunately, is it's too soon to tell. I mean, will people look out their windows and say, gee, I kind of like being able to see across the street. Um, we should try to keep it like that. Um, will people... Uh, come out the backside of this and say, I'm not sure I want to get on an airplane or uh, public transportation. I mean, the early evidence in China, uh, as many people on this call, I'm sure are aware, is that there's been a significant increase in driving and a decrease in access to public transportation uh, because people don't want to expose themselves uh, you know, to, to the virus in closed quarters. Um, so will those have durable implications for, for the energy system and for pu 
personal preferences. Um, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but I think it has, um, you know, raises some really interesting it questions for us as energy economists uh, to be watching closely. Mark, I won't let you off the hook. I'm gonna come back to the same question on G20 because I got a question about it. Uh, and given the countries involved in the G20, don't they create more barriers to energy security and transition than break them down? So looking at this future, what is your thought after having thought about this? Is the G20 the platform to break down barriers? Um, well, I mean, just as the G20 takes on the broader mission of sustainable, equitable, global, um, you know, economic um, uh, issues, um, you know, and energy and sustainability and, and the energy transition are just part of that. You know, is it, it's only 20 countries. So it's a tiny minority of the number of countries in the world, but in terms of economics, uh, economic uh, activity, uh, you know, per, you know, population, energy demand and supply. I mean, getting, eight, you know, in the case of energy, you know, and CO2, getting 80% of the way there is a significant port part of it. Um, you know, and there's important roles for uh, these countries in demonstrating pathways forward, uh, but you know, also serving as kind of more broadly um, guarantors of the system in a sense. I mean, you know, it, it's, if, 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 if the 20 biggest economies in the world can't make globalization work, then there's probably not a lot of hope for, for, for the rest. Uh, the global rest. And, and and so I think, you know, as Ken mentioned, it's incumbent on these countries to show leadership and not just leadership from a, you know, um, you know, kind of personal prerogative, you know, and what's in it for me, but the leadership as, you know, global leaders uh, and, and thinking very, and, and the G20 has always thought expansively about its role in that sense, I would say. Yeah. You mind if I jump in here real quick, Steve? Yes. Something? Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, I think uh, it might have been you, Mark, that said, um, you know, decarbonization requires a global approach in your opening remarks, and, and I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the this this will go back to something I said in my remarks about comparative advantage, and Morgan alluded to this about different priorities in different countries. You got to think about what drives those, right? At the core of the citizenry in different countries, there's a set of priorities that, you know, are guided by um, improvements in welfare, economic growth and prosperity, you know, being able to so bequest mode, to hand something off to our kids that is better than the way I sort of moved into it. Those kinds of things are all priorities at different levels for citizenry everywhere. And the way you view the world very much depends on where you sit. And so we have to recognize that when we start talking about energy transitions. Um, uh, globalization is a path there because it does help to achieve greater levels of uh, prosperity and growth. Um, but it also helps to achieve greater levels of technology transfer, greater levels of human capital development. And these are the kinds of things that are ultimately necessary if you want to see new comparative advantages emerge and the energy transition really advance in a, in a substantive way. So uh, I think it's important that everybody realize, for example, that the solution, I'll use the example of where I'm sitting, the solution in Texas for carbon emissions is not going to be the same as the solution uh, in, say, New York or in the UK or in um, Saudi Arabia. Um, pick a place, right? The solution is going to look different everywhere because everywhere has a different set of that are driven in large part by the comparative advantages that the citizenry in those, in those countries has, have been able to realize. Good inputs, Ken. I appreciate that. So we have a nice uh, perspective on energy transition. I have a question here that I, I think is very relevant. It comes back to this timeliness of COVID-19 and how it impacts the thinking that we've done. We've seen with the COVID-19 somewhat of a global supply chain failure in healthcare. And so healthcare, you know, is that going to be a canary in the coal mine, so to speak, for other types of uh, requirements in global internet connectivity? And here we're talking about now not healthcare, but moving in toward increased interdependence in energy. But what are the thoughts of the panelists on this? I, I think a perspective from each would be useful because it really is, I think, at a heart of the question we're looking at here is how do you create strength amongst the global community to try and make a transition work and create uh, secure energy? Um, Morgan, go ahead. 
Oh, okay, th thanks. Um, yeah, I think those supply chain uh, issues are critical right now, obviously. Um, they've been highlighted uh, through the pandemic and there's been response that range from uh, the kind of things that Ken has said wisely about uh, globalization to much more uh, nationalistic or um, insular responses that, that say um, we can no longer um, trust the global supply chain and therefore we have to put aspects of that in, in domestic situations to control them. And uh, while that conversation has been going on for decades, um, it's, it, it, it certainly has been highlighted in the, in the last several months. Um, we've looked at it for uh, things ranging from liquefied natural gas, LNG, to solar panels and solar energy, to minerals and metals. Um, and it, it's interesting because each of those supply chains is very different from one another. Um, and there is dominance uh, uh, across some of the supply chains and some aspects of those supply chains by different countries. And um, so you get very quickly uh, into things that um, from the, the pure economics of it and the benefits to having a diverse uh, supply and diverse demand and, and, and cooperation to the realities of geopolitics. And so um, there, you know, in the case of both solar energy, solar panels, and in some of the key minerals and metals for the energy transition, China has a very strong play on aspects of the supply chain. And that is not just at the the supply part of that chain, but through processing, manufacturing, and delivery of goods. And that that's an important piece to consider. And, and one thing that Ken said struck me on this is that while the oil market is liquid, transparent, uh, there's price discovery and it's massive, that is not the case with a lot of other markets, or sorry, it, that it's not the case with any other market that is as large as that. And so in several of these core minerals and metals, you see um, the opposite kind of market where you wouldn't even call it a market. You have domination, uh, oligopoly behavior, you have uh, no price transparency, um, and you don't have a clarity on the data, and the markets are tiny in some cases. And so how we manage the supply chain in, in those kind of situations is going to be very different than how we manage supply chains for liquid, transparent, and the huge markets. And um, But I, I, would, I guess the, the, one of the lessons from this is is that we are interdependent on each other and moving away from that interdependence because of fear or because of nationalistic uh, priorities is, is likely not a good idea going forward. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I would echo that, Steve, uh, as well. I mean, uh, you know, let's face it. I mean, energy has always been viewed as strategic. Um, I mean, I started my talk talking about, you know, Winston Churchill, you know, and, and, you know, agonizing over the military applications and implications of energy use and of energy import dependence. Um, and we have to recognize that these are legitimate national prerogatives to consider, you know, uh, you know, security implications as well as energy, you know, transitions and efficiency, you know, um, and I guess, you know, for this audience, the answer is, it's up to us to make the case, man. You know, if, if we believe in it and we can make a case that there's a greater social good, we better make it uh, because there are, uh, you know, competing perspectives and, uh, and legitimate national prerogatives that, that will, um, you, know, you know, at times potentially uh, complicate this conversation. And we have to acknowledge that. Ken, any thoughts on this? Okay, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know if you were calling on me or not. I think you were muted there for a sec, but um, um, yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, I've, I've got a colleague and I encourage everybody to, to check this out. He's, re he's recently done a piece on um, some of the supply chain fragilities. Uh, Gabe Collins uh, recently wrote this and um, uh, with an emphasis on looking at uh, US-China relations in, in particular, which is a very, sort of topical issue right now. Um, 
and it's it's up and down uh, uh, you know the the value chain for a number of different commodities that this is coming into play and of course the you know the trade tensions that have existed between the US and China for the last few years um, you know play a central role in all of this as well but um, with regard to healthcare, I don't think it's immediately translatable to energy. Um, I think uh, you, you, A, you don't have as liquid market. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. Uh, B, you don't have as many substitution opportunities either, which I think is also incredibly important. And so it means when we start talking about strategic priorities and, and uh, at a national level, it's going to take a very different tone than a discussion about energy. So I think that's something we have to keep in mind because this is always, I think I've mentioned it in my opening remarks, there's always a balancing act. We're always thinking about national priorities versus you know, keeping costs down, which is one of the reasons we've actually seen the supply chains in the healthcare industry develop the way they've developed. Uh, and that's one of those things that we're gonna have to keep in mind as we move forward, particularly if we wanna reshore a lot of these things. So. Um, you know, that's a lesson that does translate into energy, but without a doubt, when we talk about healthcare, the healthcare industry in general, there's, there's, there's just fewer substitution opportunities. Um, in general, if we're talking about electricity, for example, in the U.S., you've got a number of different ways you can generate power. Um, if you're talking about delivering insulin to a diabetic in the U.S., not so much. So, you know, these sorts of things very much uh, have to be uh, in the front of mind when we're talking about these kinds of uh, relationships. Thanks, Ken. I think we have probably time for one more question. It will be the wrap-up question for each of the panelists, so it's, you have to think hard about what your response is going to be. Uh, as I was listening to the conversation today from all, all different uh, questions and what everyone was saying on the panel, I was thinking about the final recommendation that Mark had made. And this recommendation was to look at the current energy security policies, programs, and agreements that are in place. And not just have the G20 involved, but have other international organizations contribute to the effort of this, this refreshed thinking. And you mentioned a couple, the IEA, IRENA, OPEC, OECD, IEF. Going toward the future, you know, we're talking here about transitioning to a lower carbon energy system. Are all those organizations going to remain relevant? If so, which ones, or if not, which ones do you think, or which one do you think will be the most relevant in 10 years? Mark, why don't you start? Oof, in 10 years? Yeah, um, transition is happening at that okay. point. Well, um, you know, we, we, before I uh, uh, retired from BP uh, and joined uh, the Baker Institute, you know, we, like a lot of people, had done work on the speed of the energy transition, you know, and, you know, you know, on the one hand, there is a need for a dramatic change in the world's energy system. On the other hand, the historical experience shows that the energy system changes slowly. Um, uh, moreover, um, you know, work by groups like the... Uh, Stanford Energy Modeling Forum uh, show that even in um, successful transitions, at least to a two degree pathway, um, and I realize that you know, there's talk about more rapid transitions than that even underway now, but you know, uh, in a successful transition to a two degree pathway, uh, oil and gas are still you know, bedrocks of the world's energy system for decades to come. So if your question, Steve, is 10 years, what's gonna be most important? I'm gonna go on a limb and say, you know, the big oil, the, the, the groups that represent the interests of the big oil consumers and producers. <laughs> um, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, if you're, if you have a more of a forward looking perspective, then obviously then you, you need to follow not only the sources of energy, um, you know, or the types of energy, but also, you know, where the future demand growth is going to be. And that would point us, you know, to what, you know, Mark Morgan called the global south. Uh, you know, because let's face it, in the future, in terms of growth of future demand for energy uh, and economic activity, that's where the action is going to be over the longer term. Go to Ken and then finally Morgan. Ken, what do you think about this question? Um, I do think we need to um, remain focused on the evolution of the global system. Um, a lot of our conversations around energy tend to be very OECD centric. Uh, increasingly, you know, bringing China and India and Southeast Asia into the fold. But if you want to just sort of, you know, sit back and think about it, right, the, it really is just a numbers game. Um, the OECD is roughly 1.3 billion people, 1.7 billion in the world. A um, uh, little more than half of those are, are in uh, developing Asian economies. Um, and then you've got, 
you know, roughly 3 billion or so people in the rest of the global South that are, are mired in poverty and, and that's not acceptable. So they will grow. And so when you start thinking about the future energy system, that really is the place to look. Um, it's not so much the OECD. What the OECD can do is, is try to lead by example, actually try to engage in, in the development of new technologies, keep, you know, figure out ways to get costs down, um, promote uh, uh, greater transparency across markets, um, uh, liquidity, uh, depth, trade, all these things will actually benefit everybody. Um, uh, uh, and of course, you know, uh, solid institutions that really respect intellectual property, I think are critical as well. And I think we're seeing that more and more come to the fore, uh, in these types of discussions. But, um, if you were to ask me which agency, cause I think that's how you led the question would probably be the most relevant. Um, I think the international energy agency is well situated to sort of absorb a lot of that, a lot of that discourse, um, absorb a lot of that responsibility. It is an energy agency. It is heavily focused on oil and gas, but it has in its latitude the ability to expand. And I think you might see some uh, increased interaction between agencies like the IEA and ARENA and, and others going forward as, as, the, as the world energy system evolves. Thanks, Ken. And Morgan, you have the final word. So what's your perspective on this? Thanks so much, Steve. Well, all of my media training has told me that I don't actually have to answer the question as posed, but I will, um, I, I, you know, if I have the last word, thank you very much for this. I think it's been really uh, enjoyable and engaging and, and, and we should continue these kind of conversations. You know, we, we began this work because of the G20, uh, not because of those other agencies. And many of those agencies have seats at, as observers at G20 meetings, which a lot of people in the audience here know, but maybe uh, in the wider public don't recognize. Um, and so that, that that conversation and that relationship building and that cooperation has been ongoing for, for a number of years where organizations like the IEA, IRENA, and the World Bank and others uh, actually come to these meetings and sit and uh, try to work out which of their comparative advantage is best suited to which of the tasks um, being taken. So, you know, the, the easy part in public policy is to create, it, it's easier to create new institutions or create new um, initiatives. It's much harder to wind them down. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I would echo a couple of things that Mark and Ken said. One, that the the action, as Mark said, is, is definitely in the global south for the energy transition going forward. That's both in terms of energy supply, energy demand, and investment. And that um, I think some of the work that Fatih uh, Barol has done at the IEA in expanding its partnerships with countries like India, China, South Africa, et cetera, has been um, incredibly important. And that as IRENA evolves and it's a nimble organization and takes on a clear focus on the renewables, that becomes a really important part of the piece. So I think each of them has a, an important role to play. And the, the, the key thing is for the G20 is to see where its role is. So it's, it, it, it cannot do everything. And that's why we recommended in the paper um, a handful of possible interventions where the G20 could play a functional role, building on its conversations over the last five to 10 years on energy access, energy security, and uh, climate change. So hopefully those will be uh, useful for, for those institutions going forward. And, and thank you all very much. Thanks, Morgan. An appropriately diplomatic final answer. So I let, surely left the closing remarks to the right person. Uh, we're now at the end of the time for the session. Unfortunately, we have many more questions and many more points of discussion we can have, but we'll have to turn it over to Dave. I'd just like to say in closing, I'd certainly like to thank Ken and, and Mark and Morgan Working with you guys has been fantastic and appreciate your insights today. So with that, I'll turn it back to Dave. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. This was an outstanding webinar. I know I personally learned quite, quite a bit. So much appreciate all of your time. For everyone listening, this webinar will be available on IAEE's web, uh, website for future download. If you're not already a member of the association, we certainly welcome you to join by visiting www.iae.com. Org. Thank you for attending. Wish you all a good day and I officially close this webinar.
I know. <laughs>